Now, if you were here last week, um, you will have heard my pre-notice, uh, and a, such was the excitement generated by the notice that I gave last week about today's notice, which I'm about to give you. I hope you're following this. Um, it was decided that actually a little bit more room should be made in the morning just to uh, explain uh, and excite some exciting news uh, for, for Hope Church and for something that we're going to be involved in, hopefully together as a community uh, in 2018. So um, I wonder if we could see the first slide. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, we, today we are launching um, something called Hope Reads, and uh, that's to be honest with you, I'm going to say that's smaller than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> and so if you're sitting at the back, it's probably unlikely to be able to, well, you won't be able to read it at all now, uh, but it's going to appear again any second. Uh, and underneath a Hope Reads, which I'm going to explain about in a second, um, is this little line. There we go. Uh, it says, encouraging participation in God's beautiful story. And about, uh, about 18 months ago, maybe a bit longer than that now, uh, a teaching team was launched in Hope Church and uh, we've been quite, uh, most of what we've done hasn't been particularly visible until now. And a lot of what we've been doing uh, in this, uh, this, as we've been kind of uh, forming this new team is, is trying to get uh, a real, as good a handle as we possibly can on, on the kind of the, the values for teaching and for uh, kind of Bible reading, I suppose, within our community. And we've come up with this little line, uh, encouraging participation in God's beautiful story, which I think tries to encapsulate some of where we're going um, with this and what we're going to be doing next year. So the basic plan um, that, we're going to, that I'm going to be sharing with you today, which, uh, but before I do, I just want to tell you a few other things, is that we're going to be reading the Bible together uh, in 2018. And how we're going to do that is going to be so exciting to you that by the end of the day, you are going to be just thinking, I just can't wait for 2018. Uh, I mean, I, I, there's When I say that we're going to be reading the Bible in 2018, that doesn't stop you reading it for the remainder of 2017. (laughs) You don't have to think, oh, goodness, I was just about to finish it. I'll put it down. Uh, That's not what I'm saying. But um, but you're going to be very excited, I'm quite sure, uh, for what's ahead. But I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea because this kind of, I think, sets the context for what we're going to be doing next year and how we are wanting to encourage you to see... Uh, this idea of reading through the Bible together in 2018. And the first thing that, that um, the first, or one of the key ideas of this statement, encouraging participation in God's beautiful story, is this idea of the Bible being a story. And I think that is an absolutely critical uh, way to understand the Bible. Um, Somewhat depressingly, uh, some almost, I find, uh, treat it like a textbook um, or even, uh, even worse, a kind of, uh, kind of rule book. And, uh, and I think these are kind of, t- kind of tragic um, misunderstandings, really. But really, I think the best way to see the Bible is to see it as God's story. Stories are tremendously important things. And one of the reasons why stories are tremendously important is because characters within stories are really representatives for us. That's why stories affect us the way they do. That's why when you're watching, you know, a dreadful Christmas movie, as I was with my wife just uh, last week, uh, under some duress, I have to say, and, and yet, in spite of myself... With five minutes to go, I find myself weeping as the inevitable <laughs> reconciliation happened between, you know, some, the prince of some invented land and some reporter who was pretending to be a teacher 
So the, it's a complicated story. Anyway, I found myself weeping. Why? Because stories have a way of drawing us in. They have, because the characters are, they're, 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 sim, they're symbols, they're representatives for us. And so as we watch these stories, as we read these stories, we find our hearts being affected as much as our heads, and maybe more even than our heads, and drawn in so we start to feel as they feel and think as they think. And that's why we end up, or at least I do, <laughs> weeping. I mean, even at the end of the worst movie imaginable, uh, which it certainly was close to. Um, and there's a really, there's a really great... Um, there's a really, really good kind of illustration of the power of stories uh, in the Bible itself, in Luke chapter 24, um, or this, this, which happens right at the end of the Gospels, this Gospel, when after Jesus has been, he's been crucified and he has re- been resurrected, but uh, there's a couple of disciples who, who don't know that this has happened, and I'm frankly not expecting it to happen. And I just wanted to read it to you. It's, it's quite a long, but it's a good thing to read a scripture aloud. And so I thought I'd, a, I'd do that and read this story to you. So if you want to follow along, you can. If not, just listen. I'm from Luke 24 a, and from verse 13. That very day, two of them, that was two of Jesus' disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened, and that all these things are the, the crucifixion of, of Jesus um, uh, at Passover in Jerusalem. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, Mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as these women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter, to enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures of the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village of where they were going. And he acted, I mean, he's sneaky, isn't he? He acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed and broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem 
And they have found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And then they told them what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. In a sense, these two disciples were living in the wrong story. They were living in a story, but it was the wrong one. It was the one, it was one with the, the wrong end. And as a result, they were in this hopeless place. And we are all living our lives in some kind of story, some kind of worldview. We have a way of seeing the world. And so does everybody out there. Everybody in the whole world has a worldview, has a story through which they, they read the world, have a sense of where the world's been and where the world is now and, and where it's going. Even, as is common in our secular world, that worldview really is that there is no overarching story. There is nothing, really. There's no direction that history is traveling in. And there's no sense of meaning to what we do in the current day. And the problem with both that secular worldview and the worldview that these two disciples had was that it ended being fundamentally hopeless and put them in a hopeless place. The story that you believe and the extent to which you believe it and the extent to which you know it and that you're immersed in it will affect the hope that you have on a day-to-day basis in your life. And these disciples were living in a worldview and living in a story that said Dead prophets do not come back. <laughs> so Jesus was, he was, a might, he was a prophet, he was a mighty man. But he could not be the Messiah. Because their story said, when you're crucified, you stay dead. And Jesus drew near to them and opened the scriptures to them, told them a different story. And when they heard that story, they found their hearts burning within them. And it was in that that they drew close to Jesus, or rather they invited Jesus in. And then their eyes were opened and they encountered him. They accepted a new story, a new way of seeing the world. They invited Jesus in, they encountered him, and their eyes were opened. The story that you believe about yourself and the world is incredibly important. It is the thing that gives you meaning, and it is the thing that gives you hope. But as the, this story in Emmaus suggests, that, that, that knowing the story is actually an invitation to participate in it. I didn't just kind of lapse into East London dialect there. Like participate in it, as in in the story. <laughs> so I clear that up. Um, <laughs> just for me. Um, That once they heard the story, once their hearts were burning within them, they were, they were able to invite the stranger in, participate in the breaking of the bread, and encounter Jesus. That it wasn't just a story, they were just like, oh, wow, that's really made me feel a lot better, that story that I heard on the roads, but, you know, we'll just keep going our way. No, it was, it was having the story told to them that led them in to participate in it. 
And, and, and not just to participate in this section of the story, but to then get up. I mean, they, these guys had been walking all day. They were getting ready for their bed. They were in their jammies. And suddenly, clothes back on, racing back to Jerusalem to tell everybody they knew, Jesus is alive. Accepting a new story Understanding a new story led them to participate in that story and invite others to do exactly the same. Somebody once said that the, the uh, well, they gave this um, a, a kind of metaphor, I suppose, for the Bible. He said, imagine, imagine that next week, Somebody discovered a lost Shakespeare play. I mean, that would obviously be thrilling for somebody like me, English teacher. Uh, maybe less so for some of you. But, but just imagine you were thrilled by that. A, a, a lost Shakespeare play was, was discovered. But there was, there was a section of that play missing. And, and people kind of... We're, we're kind of amazed at the beauty and, 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 the, and the wonder of this story. And yet, within it, there was this missing section. And they wanted to, to kind of recover this play, not just on the page, but as a performance. They wanted to, to put it on in a theater again and let people come and see it and, and be affected by it. So what they had to do was they had to, to complete the play, they had to fill in the missing section in the play. And the only way really to do that is to get so familiar with the play, the fragments of the play that you have, so that when you come to put pen to paper or you come to step onto the stage and open your mouth, Everything that you, you do and everything that you say is informed by and in line with the text that you actually have. In a sense, that is what the Bible is. It is a story. And although we have this story that goes right back to the beginning of humanity. And we have the end of the story, a sense of the end of the story that we get in Revelation. We have a missing section, and that section is yours. And your life is like, it's this, it's this little time that we have to get on the stage and participate in God's story, in God's play. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that except by immersing ourselves in this extraordinary play, this extraordinary message, so that everything we do and everything we say reflects and is an echo of and is in keeping with what we already have. So you get to be creative. You get to be yourself. It's not a rule book. It's not a textbook. It's a story. And you get to be an actor in it. In it. So there's a great story in the Bible about Jesus standing before the tomb of his dead friend Lazarus. And everybody's weeping, and, and Jesus, in fact, is weeping also for the death of his friend. And they're saying, Jesus, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died, and even now, oh, I know that, you know, you can raise him up on the last day. And Jesus stands before this tomb. And he prays a prayer. He says, Father, I thank you that you hear me. 
I thank you that you always hear me. He said, in fact, I'm only praying this prayer out loud so that everybody else who's here will know what is really going on in this moment. And then he points at the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. And a dead man comes out of the tomb. That is a story about Jesus, but what if it's also a story about you? What if our lives are to be about standing before dead things and telling them to live? What if we are supposed to stand in that place that Jesus has created for us before the Father and say, thank you, Father, that you, that you hear me. Thank you that you always hear me. You see, when he, when he asked the people to roll that stone away before Lazarus came out, they said to him, no, you can't do that. I mean, this is the Middle East, Jesus. It's like, you know... A hundred degrees and he's been dead for almost three days. He is stinking and this is, it's not even that he's just stinking and smelly. It's also that this is kind of weird and, and kind of breaking. It's a cultural taboo. You, you know, that's a dead man. Have you got no respect? And maybe people will say that to you in your life. You know, you, listen, you can't go to that place and start a, Church, I mean, you can't roll that stuff. That's, been, that's dead. It smells a bit there. You know, you, this, is, this is against, the, this is not the way Christians are supposed to do things. This is kind of against the cultural norm. This is, this, you're breaking a taboo. This is not how it's done around here. The piano is always on that side of the stage. But Jesus pushes past all these objections, legitimate as they were, because he knows a greater story. A story that ends with life winning. And Lazarus comes out. It is his story, but guess what? It could be yours too. And how will you know? Well, one of the ways you'll know is if you're so immersed in this story so filled by it that when you come to speak and you come to act, what comes out of you in that moment is the story that he put inside you. You know, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of talk in Christianity for many years about word and spirit. You know, like, we're a word church, We read the Bible, whether we like it or not. Um, Or we're a spirit church, you know. I mean, the Bible's great, but... (laughs) (laughs) And then, and then, and then there's people who are like, you know, well, we kind of, you know, we want the best of both worlds, so we want to be word and spirit kind of thing. And sometimes what that sounds like is like, you know, we want to be kind of, wild and do amazing things but we don't want to be too wild so we must remain anchored in the word and that sounds that sounds kind of plausible except that if we think that the spirit is actually god then we're kind of saying we want god but we just want to restrain god a little bit with the word that god gave us which doesn't make any sense to me it's kind of we need a hundred percent word or a hundred percent spirit and it's not it's not necessarily a it's not necessarily a balance more that it's two things intention and I think but I do think that that both are essential and, and maybe the way through is that is this is this the the with the full knowledge 
of the story of Scripture and filled with God himself, we walk into the world to act in accordance with this story empowered by his spirit. I mean, what would a church be like that could do that? It would change the world. So, it's a story in which we participate and the story is beautiful. And this is tremendously important. We have lost this, I think, in large part in our era. About 120 odd years ago when this building was built, they had a good understanding of the fact that the things of God should be beautiful because God is beautiful. The thing about beauty is beauty creates a question. Why? Have you ever asked, have you ever watched a sunset or a sunrise and thought to yourself, why is it so beautiful? Why does it need to be? Could we just like somebody turning out a light, end of the day, there we go. <laughs> oh, that's another one. Lights out. It's incredibly, be- everything, in, it, so much about this world is just incredibly and unnecessarily beautiful. Why is it so beautiful? And not just why is it so beautiful, why is it affecting me in the way that it does? Why do I feel the way I do when I see, you know, kind of massive waves coming into the shore or, or, you know, a beautiful starry sky at night? Why do I feel the way I feel? Beauty creates questions. And and modern man would just would just because we have an impoverished story, would just say, well, you know, they're just kind of part of this kind of biological evolutionary process and it's just neurons firing in your head and and if you follow that to its logical conclusion, in the end, you know, catching a cold is no more significant than falling in love. Because it's all just kind of neurons and biology and it doesn't mean anything. But yet, most of us just can't get away from the fact that we feel things and we can't explain them and we wish we could. And that beauty should point us, these are signs that the world was created to have meaning by a beautiful God. And so it's entirely consistent that his word should be beautiful. And sometimes, you know, when we're kind of knee deep in our fourth genealogy in five chapters or something like that, we kind of feel like, oh, is it really beautiful? And and, and actually, (laughs) maybe it's just me. but, but actually retaining that sense of the whole, that sweep, and also having help to, of kind of scholars and people who have gone further than we have to, to really understand afresh the wonder. You know, I'm an English teacher and this is a literary wonder, this book. And the more I discover about it, the more extraordinary that it gets. I said last week during my pre-notice that what I have discovered in, in my classes is that kids like the books best that you have taught them to understand properly. That actually if you're dealing with something that is is actually beautiful, the more you understand it, the more amazing it seems to you, the more you love it. It's kind of like, I'm, I, don't, I know almost nothing about classical music, and so I listen to it and I think, that's beautiful, but I have the sense that if I understood it more, if I understood how it worked, if I understood the language of music more, then I could love it better. And it's this kind of frustration where you kind of feel like you're on the edge of loving something more. And, and, and you should love it more because it is a, it's a lovable thing. And listen, 
what I'm, what I'm really saying, what I'm inviting you into in 2018 is an opportunity to fall in love with God through his word again. That you, imagine this, that this time next year you could understand this a little bit more. And because he is so good and so lovely and so beautiful, that in understanding this more, you will necessarily love him more, appreciate him more. Suddenly, we're not talking about kind of some kind of dry, dusty reading plan. We're talking about a love story that you can join in on. That is what we're inviting you to do next year with us on a journey together. I've got eight minutes and we've got a lot to do. Okay, so um, I think there are other slides which we can just fly past now. Um, Could you go to the one that says Facebook on it, David? Is that all right? If you have a phone, a smartphone, take it out. Now, if you are on... Yes, and, and hold it up so I can see. Right. If you, if you are a member of the Hope Family Facebook page, then go to the, the Hope Family Facebook page. If you're not a member of the Hope Family Facebook page, then... St- Speak to somebody sitting around you who is and who can... How do you become a member of the... Someone adds you. So can, can anybody who's in add you? Is that how it works? Okay, so if, if you want to be added to the Facebook family page and you're not on the Facebook family page, then somebody around you, if you ask them to add you, then they'll add you and you can do the, the next steps probably a bit later once you've been... Um, added in or accepted in or if there's somebody here today who can just accept people then then that would that might speed the process up now at the top of that timeline on the hope family page you will see that there is a link and the link takes you to this page which says hope reads okay so if you click that link it will take you through to this page and then you can join you can click a button on this page so that you're joined to this page So what this page is going to be, because we did a survey a while back and 98% of you were on Facebook, what what this page is going to be is going to be your um, source of encouragement for the year, okay? Source of encouragement for the year. So we are going to be showing you, um, well... First things first, we are going to be using a program uh, and, an, and an app that you can get on your phone. You might have heard of it, but you might not have. And if you, if you scroll down on the Facebook, the Hope Reads Facebook page, if you've managed to join it, if you've got a, a there's one link that is for a iPhones, and then there's one link for Android phones, and it takes you to the app store, the relevant app store, and then you can download a program called Read Scripture. Once you've downloaded the the program called Read Scripture, it will be on your phone as an app. And this is the app that we're going to be using for the year. That is, that's pretty cool. So all of the readings and the videos are all in this app, and it's all chunked day by day so that we can all follow it together and we can all follow it with greater understanding than we ever have before, as it says in the video. Now, the, 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 the common issue with, with Bible read-throughs is that you get to March and it's Leviticus, and you're thinking, <laughs> wow, um, this is a whole month of Leviticus. Um, and, and so what, what you need uh, is, is to do it, we, what we need to do is to do it together. It needs to be a corporate journey, and on that corporate journey, you need lots and lots of encouragement. So the teaching team are going to be on this Facebook, our Facebook page, and every week we are going to put up a little video with kind of, um, not so much kind of, maybe a little bit of summary of what we've been reading during the week, or maybe some reflections and what really stood out for us in, in the week, or what God 
really spoke to us to try and kickstart a conversation so that online people can be saying, oh yeah, I saw, I, this is what I felt God speak to me, or this is what um, really stood out for me this week, but also allows you that if you kind of fall off the wagon, as it were, not that there really is a wagon, but you know what I mean, um, then, you know, you, you, can, you can just get back on. You feel like you've not lost much of the story, even if you can have a bad week or something like that, or you don't. This sounds terrible. It's not, it's not, I don't mean that. I mean, because you're going to fall in love, and it's not going to feel like this. Uh, but, um, but, but, you know, that you, you have something that once a week kind of kickstarts it, and, and every week, therefore, is an opportunity to kind of reconnect with the story, no matter what has happened um, in the week that you, that's gone past. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 2018 it's going to be an unbelievable year please join us on this journey go home uh, add yourself to the Facebook page download the app get involved there'll be more information more videos going up throughout the year but it's going to be a journey that we take together